by the end of this hour, I think we will leave with a good sense of what the business view is on Brexit. I actually can't think of a better set of people um, to be talking to us this evening about the business view for Brexit. We have up here representatives from manufacturing um, services and, of course, uh, large and small businesses from across the country. So to my uh, far right is uh, Jeremy Brown. He's the special representative for the city to the EU. Um, so for the City of London Corporation, the financial sector and services, um, we will be uh, looking to Jeremy for uh, pointers there. Uh, next to him is Jigar Kakad, who is the Chief Economist and Director of Policy at ADS. He manages the policy, media and government affairs team at ADS, which is the trade organization representing the aerospace, defense, security and space industries in the UK. So one of his members you might have noticed was in the news a few days ago, <laughs> expressing their business view. And then um, finally, to my right, is Adam Marshall. He's the Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce. Adam represents the interests of accredited chambers of commerce and their tens of thousands of business members covering every size and sector of business and employing over 5 million people in the UK. So with all of the focus on what is the view of business when it comes to Brexit, I think having these guys on this panel representing um, the, the, these sectors is going to give us a really comprehensive view of um, what, we, what businesses are concerned about and some of the issues that we should be um, debating and discussing and moving um, forward. So with that, let me throw it open to the panel. What are the three things that you are most uh, concerned about when it comes to Brexit? Well, let me say briefly to start with, I think it's fair to say that most people in the city of London uh, voted for Remain. Uh, most businesses supported Britain staying in the European Union. I think less because of a sort of unalloyed enthusiasm for the EU in all of its manifestations, and more because businesses tend to be um, keen on continuity and predictability, and obviously Britain leaving the European Union uh, is a very big, uh, unpredictable event, uh, which may or may not have beneficial or disastrous consequences, depending on your point of view. But I don't think anybody would dispute that it represents uh, seismic unpredictability, certainly in the short to medium term. In terms of the uh, issues that uh, preoccupy people in the city, uh, I suppose if I had to sum up three, it would be a, a desire for some uh, form of decent future trading arrangement. In a way, that's fairly uncontroversial. Who would, who would not desire that? Uh, secondly, um, some sort of transitional arrangement to smooth out the departure, although I suspect that the value of that is greater for manufacturers than it is for services, which we could come into if, uh, if, um, if you want me to elaborate on it. And the third one is about um, uh, flows of talented employees, because the City of London, as I sometimes say, is a, a global financial centre. It's not a European centre, it's Europe's global centre hosted very well by the United Kingdom, but it is not merely a British asset. Uh, we have a lot of people in the City of London working from across the EU, obviously benefiting from freedom of movement, but we actually have even more people in the City of London who are non-British and non-EU than we have EU nationals working in the City of London, Americans, Japanese, Australians, and others. So it's a genuinely global centre, and obviously we wouldn't want to see government policies which restrict the blood flow of talent to the organism that is the City of London. Thank you very much. So clearly the relationship with this EU and um, specifically migration are the two areas, more than perhaps a transitional arrangement um, for the city is um, of importance to you. I suspect Jigar might have different views in terms of the three most important things for, uh, for your sector. Uh, slightly different, but um, uh, our sectors, aerospace, defense, security, and space, are actually, I don't think, very different even from financial services or many of the other sectors. Uh, ADS and our members um, were in favor of staying in the European Union. Um, it's because they operate uh, pan-European, just-in-time, highly integrated supply chains. Um, you know, a set of wings coming out of Broughton for Airbus have to land in Toulouse at the right time to get onto uh, the final assembly line, otherwise there's significant costs. Uh, and that, that feeds all the way down the supply chain. We participate in innovation programs. We rely on skilled uh, workers moving around Europe, um, and 
uh, for a variety of reasons, we wanted to stay in to by a factor of seven to one. That's not the result we got. So what keeps uh, us and our members up at night? What are the three things that we're worried about? First is the fact that we don't have a predictable political path to Brexit. Um, you know, that uncertainty is one of the reasons why you saw Airbus make that announcement um, about its future in the UK last week. And I, th I think the frustrating thing is actually lots of other companies are in the same boat. They're already moving activity, um, moving registrations for, cert for, for regulatory reasons, uh, stockpiling parts in the EU. People are already moving activity. Um, and it's because we don't have a predictable political path to Brexit. It's not about stopping Brexit. Let's just have a path to get there. The second thing that keeps us up is, is the regulatory regime. Um, we, you know, for aerospace, uh, you want to make sure that parts on a plane don't fail when you're in midair. You know, the safety regime is just so critical. Um, and if we leave without a deal, um, it means parts that are certified in the UK, engineers that are certified to do repairs on planes are no longer valid, not just in the UK, but across the world. That's a problem. It harms our, our, our connectivity. Um, and the last bit is its customs relationship with the EU. Um, if we can't uh, move goods across the border uh, uh, when we need it, um, you know, the competitiveness of the UK grinds to halt. And just give you an example, we have one member that has a four-hour delivery uh, performance indicator to provide spare parts to a European airline to any airport in the, in the EU. So they've got a warehouse distribution center at Heathrow, and they promised their customer they'd deliver that part within four hours. And what happens if, you know, delays getting that part through customs adds even half an hour? They fail to deliver their con on their contract and their penalties for that company. And that's up and down, you know, that, that's just one example. We have many examples where if you, there's any delays, any uncertainty getting goods across the border, supply chains grind to a halt. Um, and that affects our global competitiveness. So those are three things that keep us up at night. Thank you, Jigo. Well, I agree with much of what my colleagues have already said. So I'm, I'm here representing the Chamber of Commerce Network across the UK. We've got 75,000 businesses in 53 thriving business communities all across the country. Uh, during the referendum campaign itself, we had to play Switzerland a little bit uh, because our membership was very split, uh, split along uh, geographic lines, along size lines, along sectoral lines. Um, and there were voices both in favor and against the UK leaving the European Union. I think if I was to sum up where our businesses are now, though, it is that they, they all share a sense of great frustration with how the process is going to date. They see an intense focus on Kremlinology and process, as it were, uh, how votes and debates are happening in the Palace of Westminster and the, the, the square mile around uh, the, the UK government. Um, and very little emphasis on practicalities, outcomes, and results, which is what businesses actually care about so that they can adjust their trading patterns and get on with doing business. So I'd say the attitude from our business communities is listen to our needs, get on with it, and end the uncertainty as soon as you possibly can. And that's big firms uh, in some of the supply chains Jigo mentioned and in some of the financial services companies that Jeremy mentioned, right through to smaller companies who are active international traders. Um, I don't want to repeat anything that colleagues have said, so I'll add three things, if I can, uh, to the list of priorities. The first makes obvious business sense. It's one set of changes, not two or more. The hardest thing for businesses to deal with is constant change, be that regulatory change, change in terms of trade at the border, change in terms of the various immigration regimes that they're set faced with, etc. You want one set of changes, not multiple sets of changes. That's why getting a comprehensive deal is so important, uh, because if the UK were to crash out of the European Union without a deal, we would have one change in 2019. And then as the parties continued to negotiate for years, perhaps decades, there would be further changes to come. Getting a comprehensive deal is important to minimize the number of changes. I think the second thing that I'd say is ensuring businesses can maintain levels of market access around the world that they have had by virtue of the UK's membership of the European Union is also important. A British car produced here today goes under a preference and gets a preferential rate of tariff in South Korea. That car will not qualify in future unless we sort out the UK's continuing participation in some of these trade agreements through whatever the mechanism, be it through a bilateral free trade agreement or whatever else it might be. 
So ensuring that level of market access is, is maintained is hugely important. And then I think the third is time to prepare. Depending on the size of business you're talking about, and depending on the complexity of its supply chain, some businesses need more time than others. I would say that some of my members, the more gung-ho amongst them, sort of assume they don't need that much time to prepare. But this is a little bit like an onion. The more you peel, the more you cry. And as more of our members peel back the layers of this, the more they realize that even when they thought right at the beginning they weren't going to need a huge amount of preparation time, they say, actually, there are some things I need to work out to get on and continue to trade pragmatically. So there does need to be time to prepare as well. Thank you. Um, I want to now um, ask each of you to share some examples of what um, the businesses that you're working with are doing um, to prepare for Brexit. Because, uh, yes, as we know, we don't yet have a clear outcome as to what the UK um, will aim for on the customs front um, with the EU. Mm -hmm. We also know generally that the Prime Minister is aiming to gain the benefits of the single market, but without being in the EU. But that's also uncertain. That's not just up to us, obviously. It's also up to the EU. So in this um, period of uncertainty, um, what concrete things, what actual things, are your businesses um, doing? Just to give us a flavor. So just a couple of examples would be really useful, Jeremy. Well, the most important uh consideration. I mean, the problem with financial services and the city is there are a lot of different businesses in different sectors with different concerns or different interests. People often say to me, what does the city think of Brexit? It's quite hard to answer that in aggregate because some businesses are heavily exposed to Brexit and some have very limited exposure. I mean, most activity happening in the City of London is not dependent on Britain's membership of the European Union. It depends how you measure it, but roughly three quarters is not dependent on Britain's membership of the European Union. So businesses that are mainly concerned with that three quarters, the impact is relatively small, although they may still put some uh, uncertainty to their minds, for example, on future recruitment uh, expectations. Um, so the main thing that businesses are doing that uh, um, to prepare is that if you need a licensed presence in the EU to trade, sell your services across the EU, Obviously, when London, or for that matter, any other city in the United Kingdom, is no longer in the EU, you will no longer have a licensed presence in the EU. And so businesses, you, this is when you hear about people relocating to Frankfurt or Dublin or Paris or Amsterdam or whatever it might be, are establishing a licensed entity within the EU 27 to enable them to trade from March 2019 onwards. Uh, now, a lot of businesses already may have their licensed entity in London and use that as a sort of platform for operating across the EU 28. Uh, but in many cases, they may already have a substantial office in, say, Frankfurt. So it may well be that somebody walking down the road in Frankfurt can see the building with the big logo on the side, and they walk past that same building in two years' time, and it's still the same building with a logo on the side. They don't realise that at the moment that is a subsidiary of the London licence entity, and it will become a freestanding licence entity in Frankfurt from 2019 onwards, because uh, most people don't need to <laughs> occupy their minds with... Uh, that detail of consideration, but that is what will, will materially change. Just very quickly, in terms of concrete examples, even if you take something like uh, banking. So if you take someone like uh, Lloyds Bank, they are predominantly a UK-orientated bank, very big in the domestic market, relatively small presence in Europe. So the impact of Brexit on them, there is some impact, but it is, in some cases, second order or tangential. Uh, it is not a sort of systemic disruptive uh, effect on that business. You take someone like Standard Chartered Bank, now they are a more international bank, their global headquarters is in London, American chief executive, but they are predominantly operating in Asian markets, that's their heritage, and to quite a high degree in African markets, not so much in, in Europe. Uh, if you look at Liverpool football team, for example, their sponsor is Standard Chartered, but not because uh, they want people to open a current account on Merseyside. I don't think they have any branches anywhere in the UK, uh, apart from one in the Falkland Islands, if you count that. But um, uh, because Liverpool football team are a very big brand in Asian markets. So even though they're an international bank, the impact of Brexit, again, it, it, there is one, but it is not existential. You take something like HSBC. Sorry, I'll finish these examples soon, but I think they're quite helpful and illustrative. HSBC, now that is a genuine global bank op operating in every continent of the world. Again, their global headquarters in London, uh, although it's obviously not essential for them to have their global headquarters in the EU because they considered moving it to Hong Kong quite recently. Um, 
Uh, now, they have uh, operations, I say, in every continent. They are, by and large, an asian orientated bank. majority of their business in the world is in Asia. They have a substantial Paris office already. So I think for them, it will probably be sort of slightly shifting their weight from London to Paris in terms of their European operations, rather than a fundamental realignment of the business. But there will be some changes uh, to a greater degree than the other examples. Final example, some of the big American investment banks have put a lot of their eggs in the London basket. Maybe I shouldn't name them. But they have used London as a sort of, if you like, a sort of aircraft carrier model mm -hmm. to operate across the continent out of London. Uh, and uh, th that, of course, has efficiencies, aggregating their European activity in, in one hub. Uh, the problem with concentration of efficiency is it comes with concentration of risk. And they, as a result, are going to they're clearly going to keep a sizable presence in London because overwhelmingly the dominant global financial centre in the continent of Europe is London and will remain London. But for their operations uh, interacting with European customers across the EU27, they are likely to have to do more in the EU27 and less in London, although it is as yet uncertain quite where that bar will be set and what they will have to clear. And this comes to Adam's point that... Uh, uh, well, the point that was made by, by both the other contributors, that um, one of the anxieties for business is, uh, is unpredictability or uncertainty. In some ways, I think we, last, last point, we, we've reached peak Brexit a bit for some of these businesses because they have to be in a position where they can operate from March 2019. So they have to work on the plausible worst case scenario. Yeah. And as a result, if they get something better from the politicians at the last moment, it may be that it's almost too late for them because they have already put into effect the worst case scenario plan. Um, so we get a diminished utility as a result of business decision making being a bit decoupled yeah. so from Jeremy, the political so just process. To be clear, it sounds like, um, so the last point you made is around financial passporting. So if international banks can't count on that, and that's something that they're planning the worst case scenario for. And then the other examples are really about moving people and resources to the EU so that there is a bigger operating base. Is that already happening then in terms of movement of people, movement of um, the associated business? Uh, to some extent, but I, I uh, it's such a politicised debate that people who believe that Brexit is a very bad decision sort of seize with relish on announcements of jobs leaving London. And those who think it's a very good decision tend to be very dismissive uh, of those changes. Uh, I, th I think it's fair to say the scale of the changes has, as yet, not met the worst case scenarios. I mean, the, the changes are, in many cases, in, in dozens or maybe hundreds, but not in thousands. You know, so businesses here with maybe seven, eight, nine thousand people have still got seven, eight, nine thousand people in there. What you sometimes find in added cost is they've put another hundred into, say, the Paris office, but they haven't decreased the headcount by a hundred in London. They've just taken on extra people. I think the issue a bit for the city is, uh, is a sort of drip, drip erosion rather than... I sometimes talk about landslide changes compared to erosion changes. I mean, both ways you could end up with less cliff than you had at the beginning, but one is more dramatic and the other is, is less dramatic. It may be, it may be a, a more gradual erosion, but I don't, want to get, I don't want people to get massive... I mean, I, you know, I'm speaking on behalf of the city of London. I want to sort of slightly stress again, London, London's peer group is New York and Singapore. London dwarfs the other, I can't say it's outside arrogant, dwarfs the other European financial centres. So, you know, even in the worst case scenario, we lose, say, 5% of people to the, to some, the rest of Europe. And there's no consensus where, where in Europe they should go. We're roughly 10 times bigger than Frankfurt. So if we're 95% of the size we were at the beginning, we're still a hell of a lot bigger than the other financial centres in Europe. And I think there's a lot of people who say, look, Brexit is disruptive. Uh, we may well lose some jobs, certainly in the short term. But is it as disruptive as uh, artificial intelligence, automation, rise of China, uh, Donald Trump's policy making? Even if you want to be more, even if you want if you want to be more controversial, <laughs> British domestic politics. Okay. Uh, let me leave it as simply as that. So, you know, there are disruptive effects, but there are a multiplicity of disruptive okay. effects. Thank you. Jigar, any examples of um, what your industry is already yeah, doing? Because I, I, can, I can try to quickly name a couple. Sorry, that was wrong. Um, but J Jeremy touched on a really important point. The only thing our members know for certain is that we're leaving on the 29th of March, 2019. There's no other known knowns 
to put it, you know, you use that phrase, mm -hmm. in Brexit. That's the only thing they know, the only thing they can plan to. There's some known unknowns. There's lots of known unknowns. Probably lots of unknown unknowns. Unknown. <laughs> anyway, so, so a couple of quick examples that they're doing. Um, one, because we're worried about uh, supply chains and delays at the border, um, a lot of the, the bigger companies at the top of the supply chain are asking their suppliers to carry one month's worth of stock at their cost and to warehouse it near their customer at their own cost. You know, we're a sector that's growing by 10% a year in terms of global demand for new aircraft. To add in another, you know, 112, 8%, 10% in terms of increased production, especially for SMEs, is really difficult, but that's the requirement. And to get that in place by March 29th, 2019. The other thing is, um, I mentioned that, you know, aircraft have to be certified as safe to fly, the designs for a new engine, the parts, the way you put it together. That's done all, all done out of the European Aviation Safety Agency. If we leave without a deal, you can't continue to do that from the UK. So companies are setting up operations in the EU 27 to do design approvals, to do production approvals for, for aircraft and aircraft parts. Um, the, the, the last thing, I guess, that companies are doing that I'll mention um, is nothing, which is actually <laughs> the really worrying bit, especially for the small companies. Because the big companies can throw money and teams, and they've had task forces handling Brexit for ages. The problem is the small guys that don't have it and tend to only deal with what's right in front of them. And they don't have enough resources. They don't, have, they, don't have, they don't know enough to actually begin to plan for Brexit. And I go around the country and I talk to, talk to groups of companies and every time I ask them, well, how many are you preparing for Brexit? I get maybe three, five, at best 10% of the SMEs. Mm. Nine months away, none of them are preparing for Brexit. And I think that's, that's the thing that's got us worried. I think they should join the BCC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would help, Adam. Uh, many of them already have, and I agree completely. <laughs> um, Money well spent. I'll, 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 I'll put it this way. About a third of our membership is preparing very, very actively and doing some of the contingency planning and investing to order, in order to ensure that they can continue to operate, as both Jeremy and, and Jigar have mentioned in some of their examples. I would say there is a second third that knows it is affected, is watching very carefully what is going on, but have a reasoned argument, which is, I'm not going to start putting my limited people and resources into this until I know what I'm planning for, which is an entirely reasonable business argument to make. A lot of these will be mid-sized companies who will say, it's all hands to the pump. Our order book is actually full at the moment. Of course, management is paying attention, but we will only act when we know what we are acting on. The final third are the ostriches that uh, Jigo was referring to a moment ago. They're the ones who've done nothing or have their head in the sand. Um, and in certain cases, these are the companies I was referring to in, in, in my previous intervention, the ones who don't believe in some way that this is going to have an impact on them. But you can sort of play the six degrees of separation game. And by the time you've gotten to the third or fourth degree of separation, you realize there is an indirect impact even on a lot of those firms. So what we've been trying to do, actually, is supply firms with a very simple checklist of practicalities. Now, it doesn't presuppose any particular outcome to the political negotiation, but it tries to raise businesses' level of attention to some of the areas where they need to sort of kick the tires a little bit and figure out what they need to do. Contracts, a perfect example. Mundane, most business leaders flee from them, uh, you know, the, the, the redrafting of contracts. Simple fact of the matter is, quite a lot of business needs new paper around it in order to ensure that cross-border transactions can continue. Uh, another one would be uh, IP, intellectual property protection, where businesses may need to trademark uh, their, their intellectual property or, or register their patents or whatever else it might be in different ways than perhaps they had done previously. Customs operation, which Jigar has mentioned on a number of occasions. Are businesses registered for cross-border VAT? Do they have an EORI number which allows them actually to then trade cross-border? You know, these are very, very basic things that we're talking to businesses about and saying, spend your time looking at these basics. Don't worry about the political noise at 30,000 feet. Get back down to helicopter level and focus what's important for your particular business. To give you a few examples, Linda, um, I flew on a very big, very well-known airline uh, last week, a domestic flight within the UK to Belfast International Airport. It was operated by this very well-known airline's Austrian-flagged fleet. Uh, and uh, called out with a, with a different flight number than the one that I would have expected. That's an example of a company preparing by moving some of its registrations and some of its certification. Um, I have agricultural companies here in the United Kingdom who are so worried about their labor supply that they're actually changing their production plans 
and lowering their production forecasts for the UK, despite this amazing weather. Um, because what they're saying to us is we are not sure we can get the people through. And that's down not to fear over future status, which has been overblown. It's actually down to the devaluation of the pound and the question of whether remittances back home are worth as much as they used to be. Um, another one, IT company down in Cornwall fighting with the Home Office, desperately trying to get programmers from the countries like India that produce so many of them. Now, I wanted to raise this point. It's not a Brexit issue, but it, it raises the fact that there are so many things that are within the UK's own control that we can do to fix the fundamentals so that companies can continue Great. to grow that we are really not important. doing. Very important. So whether it's the vote on Heathrow at 10 o'clock this evening about building the third runway, which we've needed for 50 years, and now we need to get on with it, whether it's about putting clarity around our immigration rules, or whether it's about our mobile and broadband connectivity, which still remains incredibly patchy. There's a lot we can do here in order to prepare for this to help businesses get some certainty. Final uh, one that I'll raise is around <laughs> our ports. Uh, ports are usually fundamental members of chambers of commerce around the country. Why? Because they're the places that everyone goes to transship goods, whether they're coming in or they're coming out. A lot of ports are making major investments in land in anticipation of having to uh, accommodate customs regimes. They don't know what customs regimes those will be yet. Um, and they're having to work with their colleagues across Europe to say, how are we going to ensure that our companies that require these just-in-time shipments can get whatever they need within a reasonable time frame? The interesting thing that's happening though, and this is a positive and an optimistic point, is that a lot of these businesses are responding commercially. They're not throwing their hands up and saying, we'll wait for the politicians. There is actually an arbitrage going on at the moment amongst the European ports to see who's going to be fastest to be ready to handle the UK traffic mm. after Brexit, regardless of what the arrangements are. Mm. I'll give you an example. The Dutch are training new customs officers in eight months at the moment, in case they're needed. The Germans are taking two and a half years. No prizes to which ports are going to win the business thereafter in order to get stuff to and from the UK as quickly as possible. So businesses are responding in practical ways. The problem is that's requiring quite a lot of money. Um, before we open up to the audience, I just want to get a sense from the panel. Um, these are going to be um, not quite yes, no, but I just want to, uh, to throw these possibilities out mm -hmm. at you. A lot of the options which are being discussed in terms of Brexit and what the impact for most of your members is. Not all, most of your members. So say we are not in a customs union with the EU after Brexit, meaning we have some type of customs partnership agreement, MaxVac. How economically beneficial or damaging is it for your members just to have more cost and more non-tariff barriers? Because that's what it implies. If you're not in a customs union, you no longer have the roll roll trade yeah. where you just have a pallet, you roll on, you roll off. There is going to be some additional degree of checks or certification before you get to the border. Um, Igor, how big an issue is this? Uh, it's pretty big. We've estimated the cost of, you know, if you take the maximum facilitation model, max fact, technology will solve the border issue. Um, we don't think technology will solve it. We've estimated it'll add 10 to 15 percent in terms of the value of every export, act as a 10, 10 to 15 percent tariff uh, on every good that goes across the border. Um, for the aerospace sector in particular, that's an additional <coughs> two billion pounds worth of cost per year. Per year. Um, what about impact on margins? Oh uh, well, I mean that's that's just straight cost. <coughs> that's straight cost. That's straight cost. And I, I think our concern is, yes, we can have our house in order in terms of having our paperwork, you know, everything done. But what about the lorry in front of us? Because it's not yeah. just customs. You know what? You know, yes, we, the government wants to stay in the European Aviation Safety Agency, but what if the lorry in front of us has agri-food products mm -hmm. and has to have uh, sanitary checks at the border? Yeah. Yeah. We're delayed because of their delays. Mm -hmm. And that's the real concern in terms of being outside of a customs union is, is, is those knock-on consequences. Adam. It's interesting. In my membership, I have two different views. I have those who would echo a lot of what Jigar has just said. And I have those who also would say staying in a customs union with the European Union is a little bit like giving someone else the keys to your house, letting them set the rules, and telling you when you can leave. So I have that extremity of views from those who see it as fundamental to those who see it as a strategic error on the part of the UK. So yes. we've, got, we've got both of those. So just to, just to clarify that, um, the, uh, being in a customs agreement means that the UK wouldn't be able to set its own free trade agreements because you have a common external facing tariff. And so that would be the feeling. That's the Turkey model, as it were. Yes. 
No, no, so we've got, we've got that diversity of views, and I have to acknowledge that when I talk about this particular issue. The one thing I would say is, I think this has been overblown compared to the question about re mutual regulatory recognition, because 65% of the trade friction and 65% of the costs around trade friction actually is related to non-tariff barriers and regulation. Only about 35% of the cost, you know, by the estimates that I've seen, actually relates to what happens at the border itself. So we're spending twice the amount of time discussing the element of this that only has half of the actual value to business. So I think we need to get on and expand the debate, not just about customers, but about the wider question of regulation and how that affects trade. So does that mean that the single market, because um, obviously that's part of, if we leave the single market, we're not in the single market, then that has an impact on regulations and recognition yeah. of regulations and changing regulations. Do you want to elaborate a bit on that then? Yeah, and, and, and we have different business sectors who are arguing for different sorts of relationships with the European Union after we, 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 we leave the single market uh, on, under the government's plans. I mean, you know, Jeremy and, 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 and those representing the city are, 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 are trying to be as ambitious as they can, I know, in order to get some form of strong mutual recognition in place. Um, you know, I have other sectors where they say actually divergence would be okay over the long term, not immediately, but over the long term. Mm -hmm. Some of the technology businesses and the, the, those without vested interests are somewhat interested in that over the long term. And see, we're a sector where divergence leads to irrelevance because, yeah. you know, with aerospace, it's dominated by the EU regime, the US regime, and you either yeah. are a part of them and influence them or you try to, you know, if we tried to compete, we'd become irrelevant. And just one, just, um, so, just, just one last point, and I, th I, think, I think you're right, and there's one thing where we've worked together quite a lot, which is around the question of industrial standards. Again, this is not customs, it's not regulation, it's voluntary industrial standards, and will the UK stay part of the European standards model? And we've all been saying, well, there are, there, there's the American regime, there's the European regime, and there's the Chinese regime. That's it. That's it. Mm. Otherwise, you're on a branch line to nowhere. Yep. So where do we want to throw in our lots? And you know, we've been very strongly saying, let's stay in the European uh, industrial standards model. We create 35% of them anyway in the UK. Just quickly, Jeremy, in terms of the single market. Customs Union is pretty tangential to yeah, let's city focus and on financial the services. Market, yeah. the, 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 um, apart very quickly of Customs Union, it's potential to derail the wider conversation. Sure. But anyway, that's... Uh, that's yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I talk about sectors I know less about. I can understand if you're a car manufacturer having a high degree or absolute alignment with the EU if you're wishing to export your product makes sense. And I've never met anyone who's agitating for a different airbag safety standard model in the UK from the EU. Although, <laughs> there is a respectable argument, it seems to me, that because it makes sense now, will it make sense in 15, 20, 25 years' time with the advent of driverless cars, etc.? You know, is that, yeah. anyway, so and so. The reason I say that is there are lots of sectors of pharmaceuticals might be another where people want alignment. The financial services is in a different category. There is clearly an asymmetry between the power and scale of the EU and the power and scale of the UK. They're you know, six, seven, eight times bigger, depending on whether you're measuring people or economy. Um, the one sector, there may be a few others, maybe higher education might be one, but the one sector where that asymmetry is least pronounced or arguably resides on the other side of the equation is in financial services. Whereas London is the global financial centre serving the European economy, and there is nothing vaguely comparable to it in the EU 27. So, Jeremy, just to so, be clear, so the reason I say that, it, if we're not in the single market, does it harm the city? Uh, I, I think it does harm the city, uh, but it, the city will still be of a different magnitude greater, sure. mm. and it will also harm. Uh, European businesses and, for that matter, you know, public sector pension funds or whatever, who potentially have, a, who potentially lose out from a disconnection between their financial centre yep. and their activity. The reason I say, sorry, just yep. the reason is because regulatory alignment may make sense if you're making a pharmaceutical product or a car or wings or something, mm -hmm. but the idea that the UK and the City of London specifically will have its rules determined by a body that the UK is not a member of, including countries that have no discernible financial services sector domestically at all, or, if I'm going to be more politically about it, do have a financial services sector and wish to use that position of advantage to benefit themselves to the disadvantage of London, mm -hmm. would, be, would be a very, very big concession. So you find in the City of London a lot of people who voted Remain, uh, who may still regret uh, Brexit two years later, who are still quite hard line 
that we, Britain, should not be a, quote, rule taker on financial services regulation for the EU once we've left. So would you, um, I want to open this up now, um, and I think um, that there's going to be a lot of questions, I'm sure, um, and so if I'd be grateful if you could uh, introduce yourself, say who you are, and, and please keep your questions short, and we'll get as many of you as possible. And you can also direct your question to which of the panelists you would like to answer the question. So um, any uh, yeah, lady in the <laughs> corner? Hi, Lucy McNulty. I'm Brexit's editor at Financial News, and uh, I've got a question for Jeremy. Um, you, uh, two questions, actually, if I could push my luck. Um, you, uh, you said that um, Brexit is as disruptive as, as very many other things, including British domestic politics. I wonder whether you could give some examples there. Um, and uh, secondly, there's been uh, rising fears that the UK government is prioritising uh, good sectors over services in Brexit talks. And I wonder whether you had a view on that. Thank you. Okay, I was a member of Parliament for 10 years, so I've become very disciplined after that in not offering views about British domestic politics with the regularity I used to. So maybe I, I won't offer, expand on that point. Apart, apart from to say that, you know, I mean, I mean all I'm saying is... <laughs> Go well, on. Let me, I, I, let me not, not about British politics. All I'm saying is it is impossible in a sort of laboratory experiment to isolate the impact of Brexit on the British economy. Maybe easier in some sectors than others. I think there's a fair chance that people will look back in 20 years' time, or maybe 10 years' time, and think that the impact of, for example, artificial intelligence has had a more profound impact on jobs in the City of London than Brexit. And it was strange that we didn't spend more time talking about that and less time talking about Britain's membership of the European Union. But who knows, because this is all sort of futurology. I'm just saying that Brexit is not the only disruptive factor uh, in town, and you can all think of your own uh, examples. Um, I can't remember what the second question was. The focus, on, uh, <laughs> the focus on the focus on manufacturing oh, is more than services. Well, yeah. look, I mean, the government has got to uh, to try and um, uh, come up with a, the best deal possible for the economy as a whole. Uh, I think we would say that um, services are a very important part of the UK economy. Uh, City of London is clearly within that very important part in its own right of the UK economy. Um, and I only observe that both on the EU side and the UK side, there perhaps is more anxiety about queues of lorries uh, and about manufacturers, uh, and maybe more of a sense, particularly with the big financial services companies, that they have the capacity and the know-how to look after themselves to a greater degree. Um, but we would obviously very much hope that the concerns of services are taken into account because, as I say, we are, uh, unlike many other European countries, uh, an economy with a, a very dominant percentage of our uh, output um, reliant on services. So it makes little sense to us to have an outcome which uh, doesn't take that into account. Thank you. Adam, do you want to add something? No, I just, I'd agree with what you say there, Jeremy. You know, we have a significant surplus in services in our trade with the European Union and a significant deficit on goods in our trade with the European Union. We need to make sure over the coming months that attention is focused on sectors that generate positive trade advantage for the UK, as well as ensuring the smooth flow of consumer goods into this country so that prices don't go up. They, they both need focus. The, the question, I think, is, is relevant, though, as to whether services have had, at least in the media spotlight, the attention they deserve. Okay, well, we're changing that tonight. Um, <laughs> other, um, other hands, um, other questions? Um, right there, the gentleman there. Uh, good evening. My name is Yanis. I'm an associate professor at the London Business School. I think my, my question is for all three of the panelists, and it's as follows. What do you think that uh, business has learned from the Brexit experience thus far? especially if you account for the fact that uh, you found yourselves on the opposite side of, of the eventual mm -hmm. outcome. And how do you think this is going to affect your propensity in the future to actually take a stance on these big issues and your relationships with the you know, governments that play acrobatics between Remain and Brexit? So easy question, obviously, from the obvious faculty, as you would expect. Mm. Um, Jigar. Um, I, I think the biggest lesson um, business learned actually started with the, the Scottish independence referendum, which is if you don't speak out, you don't say what you know, your, the impact is, no one else will say it for you. You've got to speak up and say it early. Um, it's a lesson that industry, I think, took into the EU referendum, 
and we're seeing it now. And what we're telling our members is, you know, if you can't say it now, nine months before we're set to leave without a deal, when are you going to say it? And I, I think it's trying to make sure, you know, that if so we don't sh if we don't bus. shout about it, no one else <laughs> will will do it. You know, no one will speak on their behalf. I mean, we try, but you know, it, if we don't say it, who will? We have to fight for for what matters to us, and um, we have to do that, you know, without fear of who's in par power or the repercussions. Adam. Yeah, this is interesting because if you're a CEO of a quoted company, you're going to be thinking about your share price and your investors. If you're a private company, you're going to be thinking about your customers and suppliers. And many people, individuals in business, rely on representative organizations to take these stances for them because they are worried about real-world day-to-day impacts on their business if they stick their head above the parapet. I don't think that's going to change that much because the, the, the primary priority of any CEO has got to be the bottom line of their business. Um, and many of them will, will do that accordingly. Th those who do speak out do so because they see that bottom line very firmly under threat in some way. I'll give you an optimistic point, though, in terms of what business is learning from the Brexit experience thus far. This whole process, I think, is going to start serving as a bit of a kick up the backside for many of our businesses in this country. It is the first time in many years that many of our firms of varying sizes in varying sectors have had to fundamentally reassess their business models and how they do business. This has been a period, you know, a 40 to 50 year period of relative plenty for many of these firms. They've done well. Many of them don't have huge risk appetites, don't have huge growth aspirations because they turn over a nice profit and they say, we're doing just fine, thank you, not really interested in anything else. Um, so there's a little bit of a sense that it hurts right now, but disruption may actually be good for many of these businesses over the long term because it may lead many of them to become better businesses. And we know in this country that we need more businesses who are on the ball in terms of global that's trends and more businesses who uh, are, are thinking very heavily about their productivity. That's definitely a glass half full take. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy. Um, I think if we're, if we're being honest, uh, I mean, I'm speaking for myself a bit more now, that um, there's quite a lot of received wisdom and groupthink about among businesses before the referendum. And a lot were surprised by the outcome. And I think if they're honest, a lot of them had given very limited consideration to what they were going to do in the event of the outcome that eventually materialised. In fact, I mean, Adam's just saying that a lot of businesses aren't thinking about it two years after the result, let alone yeah. before, before the vote took place. Um, and uh, maybe that is a bit sobering for, for some businesses. Um, that they were ne not necessarily in sync to the degree they thought they were with their own country or their own workforces. I suppose the, the, other, the other conclusion I'd a little bit draw as a sort of private citizen is, um, uh, I mean, this is an odd point to make at London Business School event, but I, I think there is an assumption, particularly on the Remain side of the campaign, that the business arguments would win the vote. Um, and, uh, and therefore, if you keep stressing the business arguments and all the disruptive effects of Brexit. That will make people think again about, uh, about the outcome. Now, maybe they will. You, know, you can all make your own observation. But I suspect that a lot of issues around national identity, personal identity, sovereignty in a sort of generic sense, also weighed heavily with the electorate. In other words, the received wisdom in politics, you know, for me, when I was growing up, if you like, over recent decades, is the party that delivered on the economy, on business, won the election. That was the sort of Trump card to hold your hand. And I just observe throughout the Western world now that um, economic growth, business success, has become less directly correlated with, with political outcomes and a wider set of considerations, as I say, particularly around identity and uh, nationality, uh, have assumed a greater importance. Now, some. You may think that that's dispiriting, or you may think that that's uplifting. But the, the point I'm making is that it's, it's a less narrowly business-orientated uh, political debate than perhaps was the case 10 years ago. Mm. Hugo, you want to add? No, I, I'd agree with that. And, you know, Adam was saying businesses focus on you know, the shareholders, the bottom line, et cetera. They're not used to thinking about you know, engaging in politics around identity in a kind of a patriotic case about why uh, you should have investment in a, in a certain country. Um, they're very much focused on the numbers. And so I think it was very difficult for business to figure out how to engage in the Brexit debate when it was about identity. You're right. 
but you know, when business focuses on numbers, but the de political debate is identity, how do you actually engage? Yeah. It's yes. really difficult. Some of those business interventions were actually probably unhelpful yeah. to winning the argument at the time. Yeah. Because they were so far away I, from I, those fundamental concerns. Absolutely. Okay. Um, <laughs> any other, uh, one in the back? Yep, uh, two more. And then I think we'll have to wrap it up. Yes, please. Hi, Praful Hi. Pasarkar. I have a very simple question. My business is on AI and uh, analytics. We are a startup company. Yeah. I'm thinking, do I really need to worry about Brexit? We may be going in Spain in the next six months. Yeah. Do I really need to worry about it? We are based here, everything is here. Uh, we'll go and sell our services or whatever we are doing in Spain. Should okay. we worry about Brexit? Good question. Adam. It's a simple one, Adam. You've got to... yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, need, you, need, you need to think about it, but, but don't panic. Would be would be would be, would, be, would, be, would be my advice. Uh, you know, someone uh, you know married to a Spanish national, I would say to anyone thinking about doing business in Spain, get ready for a completely different business culture, because it is very different. Um, but um, what, what what I would say is, you know, we don't yet know whether service providers, for example, will be able to travel to other European markets in order to discharge their professional responsibilities to clients. That impacts not just small AI businesses, it also impacts Rolls-Royce in terms of the servicing of jet engines. It's, this, this, is a, this is a very big question. One of the reasons why we're focusing quite a lot on the mobility aspects of any Brexit deal is because we need to ensure that business people can still go out and work with their customers, whether this is on a B2B or a B2C basis, in other European countries after the vote. Yes, of course people will still be able to go over without a visa to have a meeting. Yes, but will they be able to provide a service in market? That remains an incredibly important topic for us. And I think anyone who's in your particular line of business should be thinking about that. Well, in fact, we are leaving the digital single market, where that is the latest, in which case that would cover, I think, your business. And it would also cover my mobile roaming charges when I go to yep. uh, the continent. So I just The Swiss want to... pay mobile roaming charges, yeah. don't they? Exactly. Yep. And so the fact that we just stopped paying and we are leaving the digital single market Top of your phones before you go. Final yeah. question in the back. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So it was a question maybe for, more for Jeremy. Um, so we were talking about the fact that we haven't seen a shift in workforce allocation towards uh, the rest of Europe. And that is, in my opinion, mainly due to the fact that we believe that so long as you have banking license to operate in Europe, you'll be fine. Um, um, or, or for other yeah. services, as long as you have a presence there. Do you think that going forward, European countries will put or governments will put more pressure on uh, banks or you know companies to have the majority of their people to actually be based there physically. Because we've seen that happening in countries like Ireland or Luxembourg in my industry, the technology industry. They were there uh, with a letterbox at the beginning because they could pay lower taxes. And then those governments uh, made significant pressure to move people, uh, operations, in significant manners there. Do you think that this is something that might happen over the next five to 10 years? Thank you. Jeremy. <clears throat> I mean, my answer is uh, yes to an extent. Um, uh, but I think this is a genuine debate within the EU27 between those who want to play Brexit more aggressively and try and drive more business out of UK and London specifically, and those who uh, see a strong London as being in their interest, not just in the UK national interest. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there is, there is a debate between a more insular protectionist vision of the European Union, which uh, is more, if you like, self-proficient in financial services, and that which is more outward-looking and embraces cooperation with London to a higher degree. And there is a, a genuine sort of strategic choice, if you like, for the EU, because uh, the disaggregation of financial services out of London, particularly if it's into a multiplicity of smaller centres, uh, adds inefficiency and cost, which customers across the EU ultimately end up paying. I mean, it wasn't a... L London isn't the big aggregated centre because we, we won a competition and a committee in Brussels decided that it was the big aggregated centre. It's a natural business-making aggregation of decisions which has made London that centre. And that is because it is in business's interest to have this aggregation of specialisms. And so clearly, if you get a disaggregation forced through Britain initially taking the Brexit decision and then the response of the EU to that Brexit decision, that has potential negative consequences as well. So my answer is, I think, up to a point, that will be what the EU seeks to do.
but there will become a tension within the EU and the sort of economic rationality of that exercise uh, about whether their motivations are becoming excessively political and insufficiently economic at a point when the elastic is stretched a bit further than some in the EU might be comfortable with. Um, <laughs> we are out of time, so I'm going to wrap up the panel um, with a, a simple question, which is, what would you like to see out of Brexit? And what do you expect to get? <laughs> <laughs> Adam. What I'd like to see is clarity. Uh, I know businesses can get on with it. I have faith in businesses' ability to transform, change, and succeed. They need that clarity. Right now, they're not getting it, and they don't look like getting it over the next six months. OK, Jigar, so what would you like to see in terms of Brexit? Customs union, single market, WTO rules, and what are you expecting? Uh, I mean, sure, we'd like to have a customs union with a high degree of regulatory alignment. But more than that, we want clarity. We need a predictable political process. Regardless of the end point, we can then begin to plan for that. Our preferred, preferred end point is, is, as I said, but give us an end point you know, and, and work towards it. Because there are bigger things. You mentioned AI and finance. We've got autonomous aircraft and electrification of aircraft. Everyone else is moving ahead except us. Let's, put, you know, let's sort Brexit so we can focus on the bigger challenges ahead. Jeremy. <clears throat> I think the referendum result should be uh, respected in good faith. Uh, but I hope that the uh, United Kingdom will have a comprehensive uh, and mutually beneficial trading relationship with the rest of our own continent. Uh, and I also, to build on a point Adam made, hope that businesses will also think in more ambitious and expansive terms, which is not incompatible with Britain's membership of the EU, but perhaps this offers them a spur to do that. 7% you know, of the people in the world live in Europe, so we can think a bit about the remaining 93% of the world's population at the same time. Uh, and it may be an opportunity for some businesses to be more imaginative and rethink some of their models. Uh, and I hope we will end up with an outcome which I suspect most people think will be disruptive to a greater or lesser extent in the, in the short to medium term, but which will, uh, will work in the, in the medium and longer term. What do I expect? <laughs> uh, something altogether less ambitious and a bit underwhelming <laughs> and I, I um, no I think I think um, I think it's very I think everything I just said though I say it myself is quite logical but um, but I uh, I don't you know I mean I, I visited every country in the EU last year and the year before I've been Brussels last week there's the EU council later this week I mean do, do, do you all feel on track for something really ambitious and mutually beneficial uh, by March of next year or even by the end of 2020? So I think, I think we will end up with something. I think we will get a deal, is my guess. Uh, it will be all right in so far as it goes, but it will be a bit lowest common denominator. And there will be an obvious need to revisit uh, the arrangements once the sort of dust has settled and the wounds have slightly healed. And we can have a more constructive conversation on both sides about how we can maximise the relationship between the UK and the EU, which is clearly an important commercial relationship for both sides. So let me just remind you, Jeremy was an MP. <laughs> <laughs> just what, did you want to add more? So just just one, one, <laughs> one, line, one line from a very wise Irish lawyer who said to me <laughs> last week in, in rural County Down, Remember, with the European Union, you never stop negotiating with the European <laughs> Union. This is going to go on for a while. We need enough clarity to get on with doing business, that's all. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I think whenever we talk about Brexit um, at the school, I often think of uh, the only certainty at the moment is uncertainty uh, when it comes to Brexit. But it sounds like, from the business view, that's the one thing that needs to be nailed down, hopefully yeah. soon, yeah. so that you can plan for whatever outcome um, there, there will be. So please join me in thanking this terrific panel giving us this amazing business view this evening. Thank you. Thank you.